Hello guys, Jonathan here again with a, another mystery weapon for you. Or actually, two weapons. Concealed within this very anonymous looking case just in front of me here. So I won't, I won't hold you in suspense any longer. Let's open this up. So, right away you can see what's roughly what's in here. We have a pair of Victorian percussion pistols, mid-century. Uh, now we can we can try to date things based on based upon stylistic features and decoration and, and technology and things like that. In this case, we pretty much know when these were made because um, if I extract one to show you, so these are marked C Lancaster. Name right might ring a bell there. One five one. New Bond Street, and then London below the name. So we have we have the name C Lancaster. That's Charles Lancaster, and this is a firm that was founded in 1826, Charles Lancaster and Company Limited, by this chap's father. Now Charles Lancaster, the senior who founded the company, died in 1847. So we know that these are immediately post-1847, based on how they look, the history of the company. Um, so we, we you know, can't always date these things very precisely, but in this case, we're fairly happy that they are pretty much bang on 1850. Now, Charles Lancaster Jr. is the Lancaster of Lancaster Oval Bore Rifle fame, if you've ever come across the Lancaster Rifle. So this, this was a, a weird form of rifling, we might cover it one day, where instead of grooves, you had an oval-shaped barrel on the inside, and that described a twist. We're gonna have to get into that now, but he became famous for that. Neither of these Lancasters are the inventor of the Lancaster pistol. If you go back to our video on the Lancaster pistol, the multi-barreled Victorian break barrel rotating striker contraption, it's quite an iconic, historic firearm. That was designed by Henry Thorne, who took over the company, the Lancaster Company, from Charles Lancaster Jr., who made this set of pistols. So all a bit convoluted, but um, very interesting nonetheless. So they are, as you can see, um, un unfinished quite deliberately. They're bright steel. Foliate decoration on the locks, on the hammer, which is, um, we, we sometimes call these dolphin hammers because they sh they're shaped a little bit like a dolphin. This one is a literal dolphin hammer because it has little eyes and ha literally looks like uh, the, the sort of a sea monster, basically. Not so much a dolphin, but they call them dolphins anyway. We have a pair of sights on here, front and rear. A little bit unusual for what are, if it wasn't already clear, very much pocket pistols. These are what we might call today subcompact, sort of concealed carry type pistols of about 1850. Other side, more of that very nice foliate type decoration. We've got very fine checkering on these walnut stocks or grips. There's a blank silver escutcheon, which is a bit of a shame. If we had a family crest or something on there, we might be able to say who these belong to because sadly, we don't actually know. Very common in this field, sadly. We've got a, a butt cap, again, quite elaborately decorated with a little uh, lid, flips up. So you'd probably store a couple of bullets in there. Both of these pistols are identical, by the way. They're not sort of left and right handed or anything. Now you've, you've possibly heard these described as turn off barrel pistols. And you can see just, just finger tight this one I can unscrew it, and then you would load, well in this case we have a, a lovely ensuite powder flask with the latch there, so you would obviously upend that and fill that very small chamber with enough powder uh, just to, well, just to level off in there, and then you'd sit um, a ball, I won't do it because I can't pick it up with gloves on, into this cup here, and then you'd screw the barrel 
back on top. Now you could do it with just your fingers, but the idea was to use the spanner. Now we don't normally get the spanner or the wrench with these pistols. They normally come to us on their own or in a pair, but with no case, or even if they're with a case, you don't always get the tool. It's got a little notch in it to fit over that front sight. And it would slide down until you get a, a snug fit and you can use it to either undo it or to nip it up tight to make sure it's not gonna go anywhere. Now, I guess with use, that might become more important. With uh, black powder fouling, making the, the, the threads uh, a tighter fit, that might become more critical. In any case, you have the tool if you should need it. Now, if you've been wondering this whole time where on earth the triggers are on these, um, you don't fire them through sheer force of will. Uh, you don't just pull back the hammer and let it go. There is, in fact, if I gently cock this, a little flip down trigger. So you get no guard around the trigger when it's deployed, but the gun is its own trigger guard. So you flip that up. And these, these are in such good condition that everything works. Uh, these, these are basically in brand new nearly brand new condition, so everything works as it should. Um, the firing mechanism, I, I mentioned percussion. In case you're not familiar, that involves um, a nipple, as they were known, or a cone, screwed into the breech there. So you've done, we've done away with our pan full of powder by this point, we've done away with our flint coming in, striking off sparks, and this is where it starts to be called a hammer. So from the 1820s onwards, in parallel with the last flintlocks, we have this percussion system. So a copper cap goes on there, and that's now that's fully cocked, trigger deployed. You'd have a cap on there, powder and ball in the front there, or rather from in, from in the middle. It's not strictly a muzzle loader. Pull the trigger, and it's going to go bang, and you might even hit what you're aiming at because it has sights. Right, so we've set aside our case and extracted the minimum of what you would need to be able to load and fire one of these pistols. Now you could potentially even do away with the spanner because as this, as this comes to us today, without any fouling or anything, you can actually unscrew the barrel with just your fingers. But let's assume that you needed the wrench. What you would do is slip that over the barrel, and it is, in fact, will only go on comfortably one way up. So it's that way up, and we can use it as intended as a wrench or a spanner. Finish it off um, without the tool, just so we don't mark up the gun. But we'll come back to that spanner in a moment, because it actually has a second feature that we haven't yet talked about. We take our Dinky little powder flask there, upend it, operate the lever, this is standard powder flask stuff, let go of the lever, flip it the right way, and if this was full of gunpowder, the powder would be in the nozzle, all measured out exactly as you need it. You would then pour in all your powder into the powder chamber. You don't, you know, not only does this measure it, but there's only enough space for, for the right amount of powder in here anyway. So it's now, the gun is now um, charged. And just let the rest of the powder drop back down into the into the uh, flask, the imaginary powder. Now, bullets. Well, as we know, let gently lay that down. As we know, the powder flask comes with three shots and the space in the butt of the gun for two more. So we take up one of our bullets, let that sit on top, place the barrel over the top, and then screw that back down. Now this is where this is where you need the spanner because it is a tight fit over that bullet. The bullet is slightly oversized for the ball. That means you don't need any wadding, any patching to stop the ball just rolling out when you load it. Good design feature. It also makes the most of that small powder charge by building up pressure in the chamber quite nicely. So that's really where it's not so much for removing the barrel, it's for and I will always get this 
the wrong way around first time. That is for cranking that down onto the bullet and effectively swaging the bullet to fit the barrel, which I won't do because I don't want to damage the lead bullet. So let's pretend that's fully, fully uh, cinched down over the bullet. Your pistol's fully loaded. We've still got to prime it, however. So we'll flip the gun round so you can see. Now, if for any reason you had to replace the nipple here, that's where the spanner comes in again because you actually have a little nipple wrench on the other end. And you can slip that over like that. And I'm not gonna do it because that is actually a bit rounded off already, but you can use the leverage there to unscrew the nipple and replace it. Those are disposable parts of the gun. They wear out, they corrode from the corrosive um, uh, content of a percussion cap and the um, gas cutting of being fired through as well. So normal, normal loading process, you wouldn't replace the nipple. You would simply put a cap on it. Now to achieve that, here comes our handy dandy powder flask again, because in the base of this, which by the way is silver, and has hallmarks on it, very nice. Slide open the end of the powder flask and we actually have a cap tin built into the powder flask, which is pretty amazing. You take a cap, there's actually a spare nipple in here as well. Very tiny fiddly caps for a gun of this size, and you place the cap onto the, the nipple like that. And you could then lower the hammer down onto it to carry it around somewhat safely, although if you dropped it on the hammer, there's a reasonable chance it's gonna go off. Um, yeah. <laughs> but that would really be your only alternative for carrying this thing ready to fire. And then you would cock it and fire it. You, you certainly don't want to carry it around in this state because you know, obviously pressure on here is going to fire this off, which I won't do. So we'll take that cap back off and safely decock the pistol. Fold up the trigger and because we don't want to shoot anybody today, we would then remove the bullet, which even just from that light um, pressure that I applied earlier was ever so slightly wedged into the bore there. It is a smooth bore barrel in pretty good, very good condition. So no rifling, but those sights are gonna give you a reasonable chance of hitting what you're aiming at. The last thing in this nice cased set is not a pair of uh, pliers, as people occasionally think, but a bullet mold. So it's a, a bivalve mold. Close it up, melt your hot lead over the campfire or whatever, pour it into the hole there, leaves a little sprue sticking out, and then you pop it open, out drops your bullet, And then you would snip off with that little bit there, the sprue, which is the bits that would stick out the top, the bit of solid lead still left poking out of that hole. And then you have yourself a, you know, it might need a bit more finishing off, but it's basically there. You could load it and shoot it. So, you know, for, for a small case of, of pistols, you're relatively speaking armed to the teeth. Now, these are really unusual. The guns themselves, the pistols themselves, are not that unusual, but I think they're quite remarkable in terms of their uh, aesthetic and the fact that they have the sights, uh, beautifully made, historically relevant as part of the Lancaster family gun making story. The, the really intriguing bit is the bit we don't know. Um, who owned them? Why did they purchase them? Did they commission them like this, which would, would have been an expensive thing to do? was Lancaster offering them in this casing arrangement and it was purchased off the shelf. We don't know any of this, unfortunately, but I think we can infer at least something from this casing because, uh, now we, pu we purchased these at auction a few years ago, um, well, a decade ago, um, and 
the, they pointed out, um, you know, this isn't something I've figured out, uh, <laughs> the auction house pointed out, this is a jewelry style case. It's not a jewelry case. It's been made to fit these, these guns and these accoutrements. Um, so it's not been adapted. It's, it hasn't, you know, they're not trying to conceal. It's not someone buying a gun and then trying to conceal it in a book or a jewelry box or whatever. But it's someone who's bought guns that are deliberately disguised as cased jewelry. And I think that tells us something. And I think that something is it was probably owned by a woman. Maybe purchased for her by her husband. We don't know. Um, could have been purchased herself. For all we know, it could have been purchased by a man, but it would be a bit weird to have what would look to a casual observer like a jewel, like a, I don't know, a necklace in a box. That would be a bit weird at that time for a gentleman. Um, so I think probably a lady. Um, and I wish we did know more because uh, that's a bit of, a bit of lost history is the historical use of firearms by women. And this is one of the things in the collection that at least nudges us in that direction, even if that, that bit of history has been lost. But uh, a wonderful um, object uh, in great condition. And uh, yeah, I just really like them. <laughs> As always, guys, thank you for watching. We actually have a new book coming out. Um, I did contribute a, a couple of entries to this one. It's called uh, the Treasures of the Royal Armouries. So it's a, a sort of lavishly illustrated book of some of our sort of highlight objects from the collection. So we have a link in the description if you'd like to check that out. As always, we have our social media outlets, um, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter that you might like to check out. And if you don't already follow us um, on Facebook and Instagram for this series or, the, or the, uh, the parallel to this series, what is this weapon? You should really check that out and you can have fun guessing what it is that we're pulling out of stores each time. Um, otherwise, guys, I'll see you again next time. Thank you very much for watching.